Please do not swear. <laughs> Morning, Jack. Wait, yep. Morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll give it another minute or two for people to join in there. We will start. People joining. Good. Always, it always takes a couple of minutes to to build, doesn't it? Yeah, it takes a couple of minutes for people to log in. We'll just give them another minute, a minute or two more. Then we'll get started. Still want people to join in. Yeah. See a few familiar names. Sherry's up early from the States. That's commitment. Commitment. Okay. All right, let's okay. crack on and make a start. And I think there are still some people joining, but they'll just have to have missed the first bit. The floor is yours, Rob. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, which is, I think, looking at the names, um, most of you, um, my name is Rob Robson. I'm the Director of People Science here at the People Experience Hub. Uh, and the People Experience Hub is a, you know, well, our, our purpose is to transform the experience of people at work. And we do that by providing employee feedback. And I think importantly to us, the support that organisations need to, to make the most of that feedback. So let me share my screen. Okay, I'm just going to unshare that and get the right view. Oh. What I'm looking for now is how I get the presenter view. So bear with me. So you probably see the presenter view now, so I just need to swap that around. I'm trying to remember how I did that the last time. Right, so. Do you see the, yeah, okay, so you, you see the, the right view now. Okay, so cracking on. So it's, uh, you know, we're all, we've all been through a, a very difficult uh, year or so. Um, and I think this, you know, this image for me summed up roughly where we are now. Um, in, in particularly in the UK, but we've got a few people from, from other countries. And you know, last year, towards the end of the year, I came across a, a paper on organizational resilience, which is actually in sport by uh, Kirsten Faisi and Mohammed Saka. And that was just below the, the third lockdown, uh, before the third lockdown. And it felt really relevant because it felt at the time like we were starting to emerge from, from the situation. Um, I've been interested in the topic of resilience for, for a while. My, my, my own background originally was, was actually in sports psychology. So, but it's actually organizations that, that fascinate me. 
And so I was really interested when I saw this in unpicking it, getting to know it better and, 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 and thinking about what it would mean for the, the work environment. So I was actually going to try and get this, this kind of out and uh, started talking about this in January. But then we went back into lockdown and it didn't feel quite like the right time again. So I put it on ice and now it feels like a good time to be starting to think about the future. So, so, so what is the context we're in? You know, it's fair to say that we've, we've just come through uh, a genuine economic and social crisis. And its effects are going to be felt for some time. Um, it's not finished yet, but we're certainly emerging from it. But I think it's important to point out that it's not just a one-off situation. When we look at this, there actually have been very few real sort of international economic shocks. Um, and you'll see that, you know, for, there were none for around about 150 years after the, the credit crisis that started in London in 1772. And ignoring the wars, which this analysis um, seems to have done. After 1929, the Great Depression, nothing again until the oil crisis in 1973. Then all of a sudden we start seeing things happening more, more regularly. And then the point that, that this came from Oliver Wyman, and the IESE Business School. And the point that they were making before the pandemic was that we're entering into a period of an extended period of economic volatility. And I've always found the term, you know, VUCA, um, volatile, uncertain, complex, or is it changing and ambiguous? A little bit cliche, but not really in the last year or so. So that's the that's the context that we're we're in, and 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 why I think you know organisational resilience is is something that, that that every business should be interested in. So the rest of the, the for the rest of the webinar, we're going to get into this concept, understand what organisational resilience is, and also you know how it it relates to other concepts of resilience why I think it's important. Um, we'll look at the capabilities that underpin it. So the concepts and the capabilities that underpin it come from directly from the literature. The implications for the people experience is very much my perspective. And so when, and so you might not agree with that. And so when it comes to opening up for the question and answers, and I'd really be interested not only in hearing your questions, but in hearing your comments as well. So what is organizational resilience? So the, the, the definition that I've, I've pieced together from, from, you know, from different parts of the literature is, is it's the dynamic capability of an organization to successfully anticipate and deal with existential threats, stresses, or crises, and emerge stronger as a result. So it's, it involves sort of characteristics and, pro and processes that emerge from this interaction between the organization and its external environment. Okay, and what it allows the organization to do is anticipate, cope with, and then adapt to these threats or crises. And in this model, which is Ducek, um, that I, I, I will, base quite a lot of the, the webinar on. It's, they're presented as stages in a process, but actually they're kind of overlapping and mutually supportive. And that's something that, that, that Ducek um, actually you know, makes in, in, the, in, in the work. And why should HR care about organizational resilience? I mean, it's, I think one of the things that we're saying about organizational resilience is it's 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 not a purely human phenomenon. It's not just about people. It's also about things like processes, systems, infrastructure, and even finance in the end. But, but I think people are, are, are very much at the heart of it. 
I think what's interesting about it is it's a concept that brings together different levels or different strands, if you like, that are often separated. And it's something that frustrates me. So well-being and performance, it puts them on the same page. And also the individual and the collective. So it doesn't, it, it's not one way of looking at this. It, it's, a, it's a way of looking at this that, that, that incorporates all of those things. And anyone that's in organizational development will talk about the importance of systems thinking. And I think resilience, organizational resilience is a very systemic concept. And I think, I think that's a good thing because in the HR landscape, there are, very, are, there are a lot of concepts and frameworks that just look at one particular aspect of, of organizational life or, or human nature through one very narrow lens and, and often suggest that this is, you know, this is the thing, this is the secret sauce. Another way of looking at this is the way that resilience manifests itself at different levels. And it presents a strong argument, I think, for starting from an organizational perspective first. Building a resilient organization creates a foundation for more resilient teams, individuals, and then ultimately that will have benefits on performance and well-being. With that foundation, any resources that you then put into things like individual well-being are likely to have an additive effect and keep that cycle going, feeding back into organizational resilience, rather than if you don't take care of the organization, just cancelling out the negative effects that the organization can have on its people. So just to compare that to a, diff a couple of different concepts uh, around resilience. The first is team resilience. Whereas organizational resilience is a combination of different things, including things like processes, structures, infrastructure. Team resilience is very much a human thing, a, a human phenomenon. And I'm not going to go into the into detail into this into this particular model, but what it says is it's more than the sum of the individual, um, you know, the resilience of the individuals on the team. It's something to do with the way that the team actually works and interacts. It's about shared experiences. It's about shared mental models. It's about things like trust. But it's also about team behaviors. And interestingly, in, in this model, the, the behaviors of preparation, managing, and learning are very similar to the, those of anticipation, coping, and adapting that are in the, the do check model. I also wanted to just delineate organizational resilience from, from mental resilience, which is generally what we're talking about when we, we talk about uh, resilience. And I also just want to just, you know, just, just be clear as well that, that that mental resilience is, is a protective um, thing. It's not just about bouncing back from adversity. It's about protecting an individual from the potential negative effects of stressors. It's situational. It's very much about how the individual interacts with their environment. So when we talk about the facilitative environment, what we mean there is, is an environment which is high support and high challenge and high support. Okay. So it's something that can be encouraged and enabled, but it's also something that's developable. Okay. It's not react, just reactive. It's not just inherent and it's not fixed. So getting into the, the capabilities that underpin the resilience or organizational res resilience. We'll start with anticipation. So under anticipation, uh, you've got ob observation and, and identification and preparation. So the observation and identification is very much in, in many respects a human um, capability because it's about um, 
fundamental like awareness uh, of potential you know issues both at the individual and the organizational level it means exploring about what might some of the unidentified risks might be that's about being connected being aware of what's going on inside and outside of the organization it might be that then about you know planning um scenario planning not, not nobody knew that the pandemic would strike exactly when it would and exactly how it would develop but the potential for one was known and so some governments and organizations will have prepared uh, plans for different scenarios so then there's the preparation which is about putting those plans into place having the process to manage risks emergency planning business continuity processes but then also making sure that people know what they need to do and they can work together effectively. So there's again, I get that a human element to that. And the, this is the, the, the interpretation piece. So this is where you might have, have different views, but, and I've, and I've limited myself to four uh, each time. So, um, you know, there's, there are other things that, that other people might think are important. And, I, and I pull, I'm pulling out psychological availability, employee voice, uh, collaboration, and alignment to purpose. When we talk about psychological availability, it, this is really about people having the headspace, if you like, to be able to engage with emerging risks um, to, to be able to see, to be able to aware. If you're stressed and overworked, your your mind is closed to to these things. You just you you, you either don't even notice, or you can't give it the headspace. You can't give it the thought. You can't engage with what it might mean very well. Okay, so that's a really important point for for the organisation because I think one of the challenges there is it means having. Um, it kind of means having a bit of spare capacity. And that's something that very much flies in you know, a dominant uh, view of, of, of organizational success or organizational, organizational performance has been, which is driven very much by sort of efficiency and, 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 and driving cost out of the organization. So from an HR perspective, it might be quite difficult to argue for additional uh, you know, additional headcount and additional costs in the business, as opposed to say some resilience training, but it might be more beneficial to the organization as a whole. I pull out our uh, employee voice. Um, and what I mean by employee voice is it's, 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 it's when, when employees voluntarily express their opinion. And usually it's about something that is they, they, change orientated. So it may be what frustrates them. It might be an idea they have. But that's where it's different from things like running your annual engagement survey, for example, where you, you might invite them to share their view on something. But actually, employee voice is a little bit more organic than that, I think. And so and a really important aspect of employee voice is psychological safety, the safety to be able to speak up. Collaboration, I'm, I think of this really in, the ter in terms of being people working together, showing trust in each other, working towards shared goals and being open, sharing information, not just internally, but also externally with networks and share and stakeholders. So, you know, encouraging your people to, 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 to develop their networks, internalize relationships and to engage in, in, in for example, in activities with the professional bodies. Uh, could be very important there. And then alignment to purpose is, you know, I think important because if you're going to be vigilant to emerging threats, you have to understand the context of that. You have to understand, uh, you know, what, what the threat means. And, and so having a clear vision, mission, you know, a purpose, is, is, is important for an organization, not only so that people feel that their role is more meaningful, but it's also about, you know, that, then understanding that when they see something going on, 
that, that they actually understand that it, actually this, this could be important for us. This, you know, I probably need to raise this. But what I think one the thing I just wanted to point you towards is what's really interesting for me is that when you look at the one of the main original concepts of engagement, which is Khan's personal engagement, the conditions for that personal engagement are psychological availability, psychological safety, and meaningfulness. And you know that so that you know it's having engaged people, not necessarily in some of the ways that we talk, that we talk about employing having people that are personally engaged in what they're doing is is really important. Okay, so rather than just listen to me wang on the whole time, um, we're going to run a quick poll. And the poll is going to be, um, so which of these or another do you think is the most important factor? And if, if it's another, it'd be great to hear what you think in, in the comments. Let's see if this works. Okay, if everyone's had the chance to, 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 to do that, I can't actually right now see the results. I, I can't. Know. Okay, so a bit of a tie there between psychological availability, employee voice, and collaboration. Great. Okay. So, and there may have been a comment there, something flashed up. Okay. So moving on to, to coping and the capabilities that underpin coping as an organization to, to a threat, it starts with confronting and accepting the reality of the situation. And of course it does. Um, but I think that has big implications really for you know culture and leadership. We've all been places where bad news isn't welcomed. Uh, and, and neither are the people who are the bearer of bad news. We can see greenwashing of dashboards and so on. So it's very much about you know leadership and, and also you know creating that, that safe environment for people to, to say what they think. They you know but for leaders it's you know it's about having the, the humility to know their limits and actually to, to empower others. If you can then accept that reality collectively then it's obviously much easier to find the right solution. And then it's about, then fundamentally, it's about mobilizing people, mobilizing their creativity, mobilizing their, their, their sort of collaborative um, you know, abilities. And so I've pulled out four, uh, four different uh, implications. Okay. Um, so first, communication. Um, it, you know, it's really important during a, a challenging period. I'm sure everybody can think back to their experiences over the last year and, and, and the importance of, of, of clarity and effective communication during, during, you know, during the pandemic. People need to know what, what, what's expected of them, what they're doing. Um, but also that, that that communication must be trusted um, in order to facilitate a speedy response. And it's also it's also important that it's two ways. So loops can be closed effectively. If you think, you know, we're, we're often dealing with novel situations in, in a crisis. So if it's not working, we need to be able to get that feedback, you know, back really quickly. So it's more about 
more functional communication than the sort of, if you like, the slight, if you like, the more open debate that you might encourage through employee voice in the anticipation stage. Our clients have used you know, employee feedback really uh, effectively during the pandemic. So they've been able to go out and very quickly just run pulse surveys and then go out and get uh, people's views on what, you know, their pl plans to reopen offices, for example, how things are working for them in terms of working from home, how they're feeling, what their well-being is like, and to gather that, be able to gather that information uh, and do it quickly is, is important. The teamwork, you know, people obviously have to mobilize efficiently towards, efficiently towards shared goals and collectively solve uh, problems. So I think this is, a, again, a little bit more practical than the, than the sort of collaborative trust that I was talking about in the, in the anticipation stage. It is just about, this is really about people getting stuff done together, but also being there to support each other. Autonomy is, you know, I think important because people, decisions need to be made quickly at this stage by the people who have the expertise and the information to, to actually be able to, to have an impact on the ground. Big decisions need to be made in a crisis by senior leaders. For example, we're going to lockdown, shut the offices. You know, that's something that, that, that needs to cut, probably needs to come on from on high. But lots of smaller decisions would need to also need to be made where the impact will be felt. And that just needs to, to happen easily. And if people don't have the I don't have the, 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 the experience of, 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 of making decisions, taking responsibility, but having that autonomy, then it's actually quite, quite difficult for them to step up and take it. There might be a bit of a tension between that concept of teamwork and autonomy, particularly if we're not in the, in, in the practice um, of, of empowering small teams. Uh, both of these have pretty big implications, you know, for management and leadership, and highlight the potential value of using methods like agile um, to manage operations. It, you know, planning ahead during such a period of, of uncertainty is difficult, and so being able to work to the next stage, you know, using the concept of things like sprints, is potentially very useful. And then I bring in diversity and inclusion because the creativity and quality of solutions will be enhanced you know, by diverse perspectives and people. And so, and also on the quality and when it comes to the quality of those sort of solutions, you know, understanding what impact it will have on different people in the organization. If you look at the debate about remote working, for example, it often seems to have been dominated by a sort of middle class professional office based perspective, not necessarily by single parents, flat sharers, people who live in multi generational households, and so on. If you don't have an inclusive environment where people feel that they belong without having to fit in, then actually drawing upon those different perspectives under pressure is actually going to be very difficult. So I've seen people react negatively to, to arguments for diversity and inclusion that are based on business benefits, because they'll say it's the right thing to do. But my, my perspective on that is just that two arguments are better than one. So time for another quick poll. Same format. Which one do you think is the most important factor? Or do you think it's something else? Okay. Right. Communication and teamwork. It's not surprising, is it? Because it's such a practical 
stage where you know things just need to happen so that's yeah i can i can see why why people have chosen those things And then, so we, we move on to the, the third stage, which is adaptation. And so this is when we, we, we start to emerge. And, and I cringe as, we, as I say this. This is, this is about you know, adapting to, to, to the new normal, an expression that creates a bit of a Marmite reaction. But being able to, to it means being able to pause, reflect, and make the right decisions about the future. You know, and that reflection and learning is, is, is so important because so many of us work in organizations that we where we recognize that actually reflection and dialogue are often, you know, subordinate to getting stuff done, bias for action. The, 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 the challenge with that, I suppose, is that is that coming out of this sort of crisis situation, either people just try and go back to things that they did before, which are actually no longer useful or no longer appropriate, or they continue doing things that were, that were appropriate during the period of crisis, but actually don't really fit the, the, the new world either. And so it's really important to be able to take that step back and in a situation like this, you know, there are so many unknowns that it's important to really actually to be able to value that learning that comes from, from, from mistakes or, or, or not necessarily mistakes, but unexpected outcomes. And those unexpected outcomes can be positive or negative. And then, of course, if you're going to learn and adapt to an organization, behavior needs to change. And so change management becomes uh, important. And I think, you know, we often, um, people say thing, to me things like, you, know, you, you can't manage change. It's not about managing change, but, but, but actually managing, you know, how, uh, you know, it's, it's really, I suppose it's about facilitating or, or enabling change. And it's not just about top down change, even when, even bottom up change, you know, it get, always gets to a point where it needs to be coordinated and it needs to be facilitated. So this isn't about necessarily about forcing change down through the organization. Okay, so the implications, I think, are about, one is, is realignment to the organization. After this period of flux, the sort of clarity of vision ensure that people are on the same page is really worth re revisiting. And that might include revisiting the whole purpose of the organization. And from an HR perspective, revisiting the people's strategy. It's a period, this is a period of time that can be really confusing for people. What's expected of me now? Where are we going? So it's really important that you can be explicit, even if that message is quite an open one. For example, look, work from wherever you need to. That's still more explicit than saying nothing. Engagement. And I mean, I suppose, in this sense, not necessarily what we might describe as employee engagement, but engaging, actively engaging with whatever's happening, with new ways of working. You know, at this point in time, a lot of people will be quite tired just keen to move on, working under pressure. But it's, a really, it's going to be really important to engage fully with what this, the immediate future is going to look like and to contribute to those emerging practices. It's a great opportunity coming out of the pandemic to, to, for organizations to create the future and leave certain things behind them. But that does mean that people need to be able to engage. And that comes back to the similar challenge in anticipation about having the headspace to engage with what's going on, or are you just so snowed under or, or worried about dropping the ball on short-term performance measures? 
when it comes to trust, you know, coming out of this crisis situation without that, you know, where there are still uncertainties, it's really important that people can trust, particularly in leaders, in their capability and their motivations. And to, it has to feel safe to start taking steps forward. If you're going to, for example, encourage your people back into the office and they question the motives of the leaders, they don't trust the leaders when they say, we will look at it, we will make sure everything is safe, then they are far more likely to resist it. Not that I'm suggesting, by the way, you should dictate whether people go back into the office or not. Um, and then empowerment. You know, successful change requires that, that the oper operational teams are enabled to step up and take responsibility for change. Whereas autonomy that I talked about earlier is a bit more about people being able to take decisions that affect them. I kind of see empowerment, or perhaps, perhaps the word enablement is about removing barriers and creating those opportunities to actually do things differently. So that might be about skills, processes, systems, as well as the ability to make uh, decisions. So it might, be, it might be empowering people to step away from some of the work in order to engage fully, reflect, learn, and so on. So another quick poll. Oh, before I go into the poll, I also want to, to just point you to the direction of some or oh, I think it's some really good stuff uh, in terms of behavior change uh, coming out of the, coming really out of the, um, the health uh, behavior uh, world. But um, Susan Mickey's, uh, or Mitchie, I'm not too sure, it's Con B system of behavior, which talks about capability, opportunity, motivation, just something to look out for. Okay, so let's run the, the next poll. Okay, let's see what answers we've got here. Okay. Yeah, empowerment. Yeah, it's a big one. And trust. Yeah, it's hard to argue uh, against those. Um, so great. Okay. Okay, so I, what I've talked about is, is implications for each of those three stages, if you like, those groups of capabilities. But I think there's, a, there's also some sort of big implications that run across the stages and, 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 and are more kind of, if you like, at a strategic level. Um, what's interesting is they're not new, they're not new news, <laughs> um, but perhaps organizational resilience is, is a good sort of hook to be able to hang some of this stuff on. You know, we all know that it can be a challenge to get business leaders to, to engage seriously with some, some thing, topics, especially if they see them as, as HR's business and, and not necessarily theirs. Um, but so, it, you know, these are in, in, a, in a, if you like, in an order, any order of importance, but reorientated to a sense of purpose. You know, so many big decisions, so much change. It really becomes important, again, to, to, to reconnect with that sense of why you exist, what you're guiding North Star is, so that those decisions and those change initiatives are all pulling in the same direction. Then, Fundamentally re-examining leadership and whatever you want to call it, there are different terms, inclusive leadership, servant leadership, the leadership, leaders must be able to engage with empathy, win trust, listen, and enable people to succeed. Flattening, flattening the hierarchy, again, there are different models, and it doesn't mean that you have to go all out on something like holocracy. But unnecessary layers of decision making need to be looked at. And ideally removed, and that doesn't need to, you know, and it, 
And I, and I, I don't actually have a problem with hier hierarchy as such. It doesn't have to be accompanied by imbalances of power, even though there's very often a relationship that there. Um, but I think to a certain degree that, that that relationship can be removed. It's done well. So raising the game on diverse, uh, diversity and inclusion, I just think it's, we've been talking about the same things for so long. <laughs> um, and so I'm probably in an HR crowd sort of preaching to the, the converted. And, and I think I'm a little concerned that some of the, some, what, you know, some of the transactional things that I see, you know, people being, a, people are appointed into chief diversity officer role because, because that's, you know, that's going to make a difference. But I, I actually think that it's something that should be baked into, the, you know, the whole people strategy. And it should be something that's seen as a collective challenge that matters to the business as a whole. When, you know, for example, appointing someone into a post may be seen as, some, as delegating that you know, to them. It's just my view. Um, and then finally, developing a strategic change capability. You know, a lot of my background is, is in change. And I think having dedicated expertise, resource methods that run across the, the business to support change is, 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 is really valuable. Having common languages, it just makes things more efficient uh, and can enable local teams to focus on what they need to do to make change happen and it doesn't have to be again it doesn't have to be a top-down exercise i think the role of uh, you know in the future of a, a strategic change function if you like is to provide those connections or, or coordinate activity so that if something's ha something good is happening in in one area then they can connect with other other areas uh, and it can and it can then spread more effectively So final poll before we move on to questions. Um, same, again, yeah, same, same uh, structure. Okay, let's see what you've said. Oh, there's a comment. I'm not sure why I can't get my mouse to. Ah, okay, so yeah, developing that change capability, really important, okay. Very interesting, very interesting. And then two thirds for that and one third for reorientating to that shared sense of purpose. That's really good. Now, there is a comment and I can't seem to get my mouse to it. Naomi, is there any chance that you could? It was me. <laughs> it was only me. Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Um, so great. Um, so that's, that's the actual presentation side of things. And, and so now I'd really just love to open up the floor. And like I said before, yes, questions are great, but I just would love to hear your comments, what you think about organizational resilience, what you think about, you know, what are your views as well? So if you drop those in the, in the, in the comments, then we'll, uh, we'll be able to pick them up, or at least Naomi will. And if I can figure out how to get my my mouse there, then I might too. Ah, I've, I've done it. <laughs> you managed can, to do it now. Yeah, I can. I was losing my mouse. That was really great, Rob. Thank you. Very interesting to think about it. And um, I think it always helps at the end just to, you know, bring it back to people's organisation and think about it internally. Um, have we got any questions coming in? Has anyone got a question or anything that they'd like to ask Rob? Either about this or just in general about engagement. 
We've got 15 minutes left. Yeah, we've got one here. Okay, I had a great question here, Rob. So, what are your top three tips for adapting to resilience? I've got a little bit of interference from what you said, and I've lost my mouse again. <laughs> so, <laughs> top three, top three tips on adapting to resilience. Oh, so, so I guess so, 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 so developing that resilience. Here, I guess is what the question is. Is there a top three tips? Are I think. Oh God, <laughs> three. I, I, I think. The first one is, I'm going to start with um, really challenging leadership to, 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 you know, to, to, to value that kind of whole dialogue, listening, um, and, and for them to, to see themselves as not having to be kind of the expert, but to be the, you know, the, the sort of a, more of a facilitator of the organization and to encourage other people to, to contribute and to, to share their views. Um, I think sort of very closely related to that is to really focus on the, the sort of culture of, of inclusion. Um, the whole thing about being kind of an adaptable organization is, and the whole thing about being able to deal with the crisis and come emerge from a crisis and come up with collaborative creative solutions, that's not going to happen with the same few people in a room, you know, all the time. That, that you have to, um, you have to, to, to be able to harness the sort of, if you like, the, the creativity of of the organization as a whole. And then I'm going to say that's two. <laughs> and I think, listen, listen, you know, and I think from an HR point of view, really listen and focus in on what the business and, and its people are asking for and, and need and focus less on HR stuff, you know, connect that that people strategy to what is really required of the organization in the future um, and, and, and focus on delivering that. I don't know if they're the right three things, but three things that popped into my head anyway. I'd love to hear what other people think the answers to that question. Drop it into drop, drop into a comment if you have a view on that. Okay, I think there's <laughs> anything. Um, any, any more questions? We close it off. Has everybody still alive? Well, they, they were voting, so that <laughs> suggests that, that, that you were. Yeah, I think that's does that mean that, does that mean that does that mean that everybody's happy? Oh, here we go. Oh, Great question. Oh, oh, right. Uh, okay. I think someone was just typing, typing this, it's quite a long one. Um, so someone said, you spoke about a volatile, on a volatile time at the moment. So when does that anticipation turn into fear? And then how does that, how do you think that will have an effect on growth and development? Yeah, great. It, it, great, because that sort of what we might describe as vigilance comes from the same place as, as fear. And when we talk about, I'm going to go up to, I'm going to go back. We've got another question as well after this one, Rob. Yeah, so great. I'm going to go back to, to this, this psychological resilience and, and challenge mindset. Because it's the same, that, that, that idea of vigilance is, is it, it comes from the same place as fear, but it's about being able to, being able to, to see that challenge and respond positively positively to it and that's what they, they mean by the, the, the challenge mindset so 
what, 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 this, what this model suggests is that this is about that facilitative environment where people are, they're challenged, but they're supported. And so, and so that resilience develops over time. And so, and, and it helps people to approach these riskier situations from a more positive perspective. But it's also about that growth and development of personal qualities that, that it can underpin um, resilience, like things like self-awareness. Um, and there are many, many different you know, ways in which different, you know, the, the, that list of personal qualities is, is as long as your arm. Um, and there are many, many different tools and techniques and skills that you can develop, you know, things like mindfulness, like acceptance, um, but also more hard skills like planning and, it, it, you know, it's, it's a variety of things, but it's about building, building over time. And it's only by interacting with that environment, that challenging environment that we ultimately kind of be more, become more comfortable about dealing with it. And, and that challenge mindset sort of leaning into it. Awesome. So this is a comment and a question in one. So it's a lovely comment. So we've had, there's yeah. been a lot of useful content covered in a fairly short space of time. Yes, we're, you know, we're aware we've covered it in an hour and it's quite hard going. So, you know, if you do have any questions after this session that you don't want to ask on here, please, you know, do get in touch. Um, and thanks for the thought for the session. Where would you start in, with the introduction of a, of a DNI strategy, Rob? I, you know, I think that um, it's a really where I would start is by looking at DNI as a theme rather than a, you know, rather than start, rather than starting by saying, right, DNI, what are we going to do with it? I think you have to really have to focus on that that link between right what's the business strategy and then what are the key themes for our people's strategy and if we say if we say that dni is a theme then how do we weave that into everything that we do and so you take dni and you say you know what does it mean to us what is our aspiration for it and then what does that mean for, and that's where you start looking at HR stuff. That's where you start looking at your, if you like the pillars in HR, you say, what recruitment selection, um, learning and development, organizational, um, you know, organizational development and design, for example. Then you challenge your organizational, you know, you challenge each of those teams to go, right, how are you going to weave uh, help us achieve this um, this aspiration for um, you know the if you like the vision for um, diversity and inclusion make it everybody's challenge and so the same goes really to the you know to the leadership team how do we collectively and individually respond to this and make this happen. Awesome. I think that was our last question. Um, unless anyone again has got any, any burning desire to ask anything. Um, thank you to everybody that's come along today. I can see that some people are dropping off that towards the end. Um, uh, I will be sending a follow-up email from this. So if anyone would like a copy of the slides, we we'll happy to share those around. Um, and there is an ebook on this as well that I'll be sharing. But if you do have any questions or anything you want to recover with Rob, um, he's going to make some time available. Um, so if anyone wants a one -on session or a call, uh, let us know and we can book some time and we'll discuss it further in relation to your organisation and your role. Is that okay, Rob? Yep, brilliant. Okay. Well, I just, yes. Um, so what we'll do, I've just seen John, John would like the slide. I can, we can send them out, but we've, we've also got, um, what we've actually got is a little bit of a, an e-book, if you like, um, that's a bit of a grand title for it, but which goes in actually has probably a little bit more detail on the page, has the same content, but a little bit more, more detail on the page. So we'll, we'll, we'll include that um, when we, we mail out. Yeah. But I'd just like to say like, thanks to everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for engaging. And yeah, thank you. Have a good day. <laughs>